Principle number five, freeloading atheists. A few years ago, I visited a large urban church that attracted students from universities across the city. The leader of the college and career group told me that he was earning a doctoral degree in chemistry. Excellent, I said. Have you ever considered the ways chemistry relates to your understanding of Christianity? For example, have you studied theories of chemical evolution and the origin of life? Oh no, he responded. That's why I went to synthetic chemist went into synthetic chemistry, so I would not have to deal with those issues. Later that evening, while mingling with other students, I met a young woman majoring in biology. Great, I said. Have you read up on some of the controversial issues related to your field, like evolution and intelligent design? To my surprise, her response was almost identical to the young chemist's. Oh no, that's why I went into pre-med, so I don't have to deal with those issues. These were bright, well-educated young adults who could use their gifts to educate the church on how to enter into public discourse with an informed voice. Yet, they were refusing to step to, up to the plate. Many Christians seem at a loss in constructing a biblical worldview suitable for the public arena. Typically, they simply restate biblical theology. For example, George Barna conducts surveys to measure how many Christians hold a biblical worldview. His definition, however, consists of theological statements that the Bible is totally accurate, that Jesus lived a sinless life, that Satan is real, that people cannot earn their way into heaven by trying to be good, and so on. But a worldview is not the same thing as a theology. A worldview applies theological truths to the fields such as philosophy, science, education, entertainment, and politics. Principle number five, replace, replace the idol, make the case for Christianity. One of the best ways to craft biblical answers is to listen more closely to the questions. The Christian message will be most relevant when it is articulated at the specific points where people recognize the flaws and failures of their own worldviews. In principle number three, for example, we met thinkers who recognize that their reductionistic worldviews have outcomes that they themselves regard as alien and repugnant outcomes that they themselves cannot live with. In principle number four, we met people who reply, rely implicitly on a biblical view of human reason. We could say that reductionists, reductionists cannot live with the con, within the confines of their own worldview box, so they smuggle in ladders from a Christian worldview to climb out of the box. They are hungry for a fuller, more humane worldview when their, than their idols give them. Surprising as it sounds, the Christian worldview is so appealing that even those who reject it often borrow from it, whether consciously or unconsciously. To craft a case for Christianity in every field would take another book, but we can get started by identifying those elements that people smuggle in from Christian worldviews. They're showing us where their own worldviews break down, and at the same time, what they find most appealing about Christianity. These provide strategic starting points for framing a biblical worldview attuned to the questions of our day. Can a relativist oppose racism? Let's start with a few widespread examples. Many people today claim to be moral relativists, arguing that there is no universal, timeless moral law. Yet, they are likely to turn around and insist that acts of racism or abuse are wrong not just unpleasant or personally offensive, but genuinely wrong. And when they protest vigorously, if they themselves are cheated or violated in any way. Indeed, people cannot function for even a few hours without making moral evaluations. He shouldn't say that. She is so mean. Ironically, moral relativists even pride themselves on being morally superior to others. After all, they are tolerant and not non-judgmental. They are like they are not like other people who are insufferably bigoted and closed-minded deserving the harshest con condemnation. Every person draws a line in the sand somewhere that allows him or her to feel morally superior. 
Like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable who thanks God that he did that he was not like other people. Luke 18.11 Moral relativism may claim to be about tolerance and human humility, but in reality it often fosters a highly judgmental condemning attitude. The upshot is that many people imbibe the language of moral relativism by their words, but their words do not match what they really are as fully functional human beings. Instead, it is the Christian worldview that fits who they are. Because humans are made in the image of God, they are hardwired with an intrinsic moral sense. Romans 2 says those who do not have God's law in, in written form have the moral law written on their hearts, as said in Romans 2.15. They cannot help making moral claims, claims that have no basis in their own relativistic worldview. Claims that make sense only on the basis of biblical worldview they reject. You might say they function as if Christianity is true. The recognition of moral truths is an aspect of general revelation. No matter how vigorously people suppress that knowledge, it keeps rising to the surface. Another example are people who claim to be skeptics with the regard of, to knowledge. On one hand, they claim they, we cannot be sure of anything. On the other hand, they are likely to insist that science has proved their own favorite theories. In practical life, they probably check their bank statements to verify the fi that the figures are correct. In short, they live and act as though they do have access to genuine knowledge. No matter how skeptical someone is, some things are virtually impossible to doubt, at least in practice. No one really doubts that the material world is real. We all look both ways before crossing the street. No one doubts inner experiences like pleasure or pain. If I say I have a headache, you don't ask. How do you know? We do not, we do not doubt the reality of cause and effect. We trust that fire will heat and ice will cool. No one doubts his or her personal existence. We use the word I. If anyone does deny these basic facts, we, can, we call him insane. Or a philosopher. And even philosophers deny such elemental facts only provisionally, as we saw earlier. David Hume is the poster boy for extreme empiricism, which led him to extreme skepticism. Yet Hume found it impossible to maintain his skepticism when he left his study, when he joined his friends for a game of backgammon, as he put it. In the occupations of everyday life, Hume wrote, skeptical doubts vanish like smoke and leave the most determined skeptic and leave the most determined skeptic in the same condition as other mortals. You might say there are no skeptics in the foxholes of real life. When they have to function in the ordinary world, their skepticism vanishes like smoke. They are compelled to act as if they have access to genuine knowledge in a way that their own worldview denies is possible. In short, they must act as if a Christian epistemology is true. Christianity teaches that humans are made in the image of God. Our minds and senses are designed to function in God's world. Even those who hold to extreme skepticism are forced by the sheer circumstances of life to act as if the biblical view of human cognition is true. Why do people hold these ideas that are not supported by their own worldview? Scripture says all people are made in God's image, live in God's world, and experience God's common grace. As a result, in practice, they experience the living truths of general revelation, even if they selectively suppress that knowledge. As psychologists tell us, suppressed knowledge eventually works its way to the surface. At those times, Thomas Johnson says, people act and talk according to their repressed knowledge, which they receive from God's general revelation, instead of acting according to the beliefs they claim to accept. The fact that everyone has to function through Christianity is true, is true opens a creative opportunity for addressing the secular world. Christianity provides the basis for the way humans can't help behaving anyway. In making the case for a biblical worldview, a strategic place to start is by showing that it alone gives a basis for the ways we all have to function, no matter which worldview we hold. 
the confection of Richard the confession of Richard Rorty. One challenge to building a case for Christianity is that its principles underlie so much of our shared culture that we no longer recognize them as distinctively biblical. For example, Westerners often pride themselves on holding noble ideas such as equality and universal human rights. Yet, ironically, as we saw in earlier chapters, the dominant worldviews of our day deny the reality of human freedom and give no basis for moral ideas such as human rights. Where did the idea of equal rights come from? The 19th century political thinker Alexis de Tocqueville said the idea came from Christianity. The most profound geniuses of Rome and Greece never came up with the idea of equal rights, he wrote. Jesus Christ had to come to earth to make it understood that all members of the human species are naturally alike and equal. The 19th century atheist Friedrich Nietzsche agreed. Another Christian concept has passed even more deeply into the tissue of modern modernity. The concept, the concept of the equality of souls before God. This concept furnishes the prototype of all theories of equal rights. The contemporary atheist Luke Ferry says the same thing. We tend to take the concept of equality for granted. Yet, it was Christianity that overthrew ancient social hierarchies between rich and poor, masters and slaves. According to Christianity, we are all brothers on the same level of, as creatures of God. Ferry writes, Christianity is the first universalist ethos. A few intrepid atheists admit outright that they have to borrow the ideal of human rights from Christianity. Richard Rorty was a committed Darwinist. And in Darwinism, Darwinian struggle for existence, the strong prevail while the weak are left behind. So evolution cannot be the source of universal human rights. Instead, Rorty says the concept came from religious claims that human beings are made in the image of God. He cheerfully admits that he reaches over and borrows the concept, concept of universal rights from Christianity. He even calls himself a freeloading atheist. This Jewish and Christian element in our tradition is gratefully invoked by freeloading atheists like myself. At the birth of our nation, the American founders deemed it self-evident that human rights must be grounded in God. The Declaration of Independence leads off with those bright, blazing words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. In the summer of 2013, a beer company sparked controversy when it released an advertisement for Independence Day that deleted the crucial words by their creator. The ad said, they are endowed with certain unalienable, unalienable rights. Endowed by whom? The advertisement is emblematic of what many secularists do. They borrow ideals like equality and rights from a biblical worldview but cut them off from their source in the Creator. They are freeloaders. Christians should reclaim these noble ideals, making the case that they are logically supported only by a biblical worldview. Atheists often denounce Christianity as harsh and negative, but in reality it offers a much more positive view of the human person than any competing religion or worldview. It is so appealing that adherents of other worldviews keep freeloading the parts they like best. What makes science possible? Another element of Western culture so widespread that we no longer recognize it as distinctively Christian is the scientific enterprise itself. The common stereotype is that religion and science are at war with one another, but historians have turned the stereotype on its head. Consider, for example, the laws of nature. Today, the idea is so familiar that it strikes us as common sense. Yet historians tell us that no other culture, East or West, ancient or modern, came up with the concept of the laws of nature. It only appeared in Europe during the Middle Ages, a period when Western culture was thoroughly permeated by Christian assumptions. As the respected historian A.R. Hall notes, the use of the word law in the context of natural events would have would have been unintelligible in antiquity, whereas the Hebraic, Hebraic and Christian belief in a deity 
who was once who was at once creator and lawgiver rendered it valid. Of course, all societies that recognized cause and effect patterns in nature, which enabled them to construct buildings and bridges, and the difference the difference is that they regarded those patterns as merely practical rules of thumb. The intrinsic order of nature itself was thought to be inscrutable to the human mind. And when people do not think they are ra there are rational laws behind nat natural phenomenon, they will not go looking for them, and science will never get started. Philosopher Mary Migley even describes Christianity as science's own worldview. She writes, science does, does have its own worldview that includes guiding presumptions about the nature of the world. The founders of modern science expressed these very plainly for their time. Cosmic order, they said, flows wholly from God, so science redounds to his glory. Paul Davies makes the same point even more strongly. All the early scientists, like Newton, were religious in one way or another, he writes. They saw their science as a means of uncovering traces of God's handiwork in the universe. What we now call the laws of nature, they regarded as thoughts in the mind of God. So, in doing science, they supposed, one might be able to glimpse the mind of God, an exhilarating and audacious claim. Audacious, perhaps, but a claim that remains a central underpinning for the scientific enterprise right to our own day. Science still has to assume that the world has an intelligible order, yet the materialist or naturalist worldview cannot account for that order. If the universe is the product of non-rational processes, why does it have a rational order? If the universe is not the product of a mind, why is it comprehensible to the human mind? Among most scientists today, the underlying order in nature, the laws of physics, are simply accepted as given, as brute facts, Davies writes. Nobody asks where did they come from. At least they do not ha at least they do not do so in polite company. However, even the most atheistic scientist accepts as an act of faith that it, that there is rational basis to ex physical existence manifested as law-like order in nature. Science requires an act of faith. What is that faith based on? Davies draws this stunning conclusion. So science can proceed only if the scientist adopts an essentially theological worldview. In short, every atheist has to adopt a biblical worldview to, pr pr to pursue science at all. Christians should confidently reclaim the biblical principles that made science possible in the first place, and that continue to provide its philosophical underpinnings today. An atheist decrees human, humanism. To track down additional cases of freeloading, we can eavesdrop on atheists in house debates. For example, John Gray regularly castigates his follow, fellow atheists and materialists for their habit of freeloading. Logically, he points out materialism leads to reductionism, the conclusion that humans are nothing but animals. But most materialists do not want to accept the ble that bleak conclusion. They want to grant humanity a higher status and dignity. They want to believe that humans have consciousness, selfhood, and free will. Gray writes that high, that high view of humanity he labels humanism, and he denounces it as a prime example of freeloading. Humanists never tire of preaching the gospel of human freedom, Gray complains, but Darwin has shown us that we are animals, and therefore the idea of free will does not come from science. Instead, its origins are in religion, not just any religion, but the Christian faith against which humanists rail so obsessively. Thus, humanism is only a secular version of Christian principles. We could say that humanists do not want to live within the confines of their own materialist box, so they smuggle in ladders from a Christian worldview to climb out of that box. Nagel, Darwin, almost certainly false. So now let's eavesdrop on another side of the debate, the people Gray calls humanists. 
who do not want to accept the inhuman consequence of reductionism. Thomas Nagel is the author of Mind and Cosmos, which bears the provocative subtitle Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinism Darwinian concept of nature is almost certainly false. He argues that Darwinist theory is almost certainly false precisely because it leads to reductionism, and reductionist theories fail to explain what we know about the world. Consider the lowly pocket calculator. Tap in 5 plus 3 and the number 8 appears on the screen. The figure 8 pattern of pixels may be explainable in purely physical terms, as the plus of electrons traveling through microchip gates. But Nagel argues there is no reductionist explanation of how the calculator was programmed to produce the 8 in the first place. That requires the intention of the designer. Nagel is an atheist, so he is not alluding to a divine designer. He is arguing that Darwinist theory cannot explain even human designers. Something more is needed to explain how there can be conscious thinking creatures. Humans exhibit a different kind, not merely in degree. Something more is also needed to explain moral and scientific knowledge. Nagel argues that the evolutionary concept of the mind undercuts our confidence in the objective truth of our moral beliefs, as well as the objective truth of our mathematical and scientific reasoning. To remind yourself why evolutionary epistemology undercuts human knowledge, turn back to principle number four. Yet, Nagel says, we cannot just give up our knowledge in these areas. Why not? Because the knowledge is based ultimately on common sense and what is plainly undeniable. Do you recognize the telltale phrases that indicate general revelation? Neo-Darwinism contradicts what is based on common sense and what is plainly undeniable. Nagel is trapped in cognitive dissidence. On one hand, he does not want to accept reductionism, which he criticizes as a triumph of ideological theory over common sense. He praises critics of Darwinism, including intelligent design theorists, an act for which he has been viciously attacked. Nagel even grants that a theistic worldview would solve his problems, that the existence of God would explain the very things that Darwinism cannot explain, like mind and morality. Nevertheless, he rejects the theistic answer. Why? The reason is not so much intellectual as emotional. I want atheism to be true. I do not want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. He admits that his underlying motive is a fear of religion itself rooted ultimately in a cosmic authority problem. Having rejected God, however, that alternative does Nagel, does Nagel, what alternative does Nagel propose? Nothing at all. My aim is to present the problem rather than the purpose to propose a solution. Nagel is an eye-opening example of an atheist who is desperately trying to main ba maintain both sides of a severe cognitive dissidence. On one hand, he maintains his atheism. On the other hand, he refuses to give up the undeniable facts of common sense that theism alone can explain. Nagel is trying to retain the benefits of a Christian worldview while he rejects their basis in Christianity. He is freeloading. Problems of a Proud Atheist Another humanist suffering from severe cognitive dissidence is Raymond Tallis a medical doctor and the author of Aping, Aping Mankind. Talus boasts that he is a proud atheist and evolutionist. At the same time, he argues that something rather important about us is left unexplained by evolutionary theory. Indeed, he lists several important things left unexplained. Isn't, isn't there a problem in explaining how the blind forces of physics brought about cognitively cited humans who are able to see and identify and comment on the blind forces of physics. How did the forces of physics create beings who transcend those forces? Isn't there a problem in explaining how natural forces created humans who are able to turn around 
and use those forces to engage with nature as if from the outside? Why are, they, why are humans able to rise above the forces that supposedly created them? Can a puppet gain control over the puppeteer? Isn't there a problem in explaining how the universe brought us into being by mindless process that are processes that are entirely without purpose? How did a mindless process create beings with minds? How did a purposeless process create beings with purpose? Isn't there a problem in explaining how an undesigned process could produce one species that is indeed a designer. How did we humans get to be so different? How is it possible for the humans to be so different from the forces that supposedly produced them? How can water rise above its source? A reductionist would resolve the dilemma simply by decreeing that humans are not so different at all that what appear to be differences in kind are really only differences in degree. But Talus rejects reductionism. Indeed, he is passionately concerned that a form of neurobiological reductionism is gaining a beachhead in virtually every field. In the arts, neuroaesthetics claims that we are drawn to works of art because certain visual patterns stimulate the reward centers of the brain. In literature, neuroliterary critics try to explain why we love literature by scanning people's brains as they read Shakespeare. In legal theory, neural law seeks to establish guilt or innocence using magnetic res resonance imaging (MRIs). In philosophy, neuroethics claims that moral standards, practices, and policies reside in our neurobiology. Neuroeconomics uses brain imaging methods to determine how consumers' brains respond to brands and products. Neuropolitics hopes, that, hopes to use the brain science to guide people in making policy decisions. And neurotheology uses MRIs to find the God spot the part of the brain that supposedly leads people to conceive the idea of God and undergo a mystical experiences. These neuro theories are more faddish than factual, Talus complains. Consider the attempt to explain Christianity by neurobiology. What kinds of nerve impulses are capable of transcending their finite, local, transient condition in order to conceive of something that is infinite? ubiquitous and eternal. Talus even invites theists to make common cause with atheists like himself against the common enemy of neuroevolutionary reductionism. Yet, through, though he seeks allies among Christians, Talus empathetic, emphatically rejects Christianity itself. So what answer does he propose to the reductionism he so passionately opposes? Nothing at all. The truth is that I don't know. What do we learn by eavesdropping on atheists? First, many of them recognize the limitations and failures of their own worldview. In fact, a compelling case can be made against atheism using their own words and arguments. Second, many atheists find elements of a Christian worldview so appealing that they keep borrowing them. They are freeloaders. When we realize how extensive freeloading is, we come to a greater appreciation of how attractive a biblical worldview really is. Otherwise, why is everyone trying to co-opt the parts they like best? No wonder Paul says he is not ashamed of the gospel in Romans 1.16. Recall that in scripture, to be put to shame means to be disappointed or let down. Paul is saying that a Christian worldview will not let you down. It fulfills humanity's highest hopes and ideals. This is the good news that will attract people to the gospel who are jaded by the failure and inhumanity of reductionism. Give me that old-time philosophy. Perhaps the most great... Perhaps... A big example of freeloading is a movement to hijack the explicitly religious dimensions of Christianity. 
For example, there is a new field that uses philosophy to treat psychological problems. Labeled philosophical counseling, it is being touted as an alternative to the care provided by therapists, priests, and pastors. These are atheists who want the psychological comfort of Christianity while rejecting its content. A book on the subject titled Plato, Not Prozac, became an international hit. You can even get certified to be a philosophical counselor. The Washington Post article says that the counselors are like intellectual life coaches, very intellectual. Their in-depth knowledge of Jean Paul's Sartre's existentialist theories on the nature of life and can recite passages from Martin Heidegger's phen phenomenological explorations of the question of being. And they use them to help clients overcome their mother issues. Philosophical counseling may be a new field, but the concept itself is not novel. Philosophies have never been merely academic enterprises. They begin with a god replacement and develop an entire worldview, exhorting people how to make sense of life and to prepare for death. The difference is that today, some atheists are actively seeking to hijack the religious spirit, as Terry Eagleton puts it. They claim that secularism can nurture spirituality. An example of is Luke Ferry's A Brief History of Thought, a philosophical guide to living. Ferry offers spirituality for secular people. If religions can be defined as doctrines of salvation, the great philosophies can also be defined as doctrines of salvation, but without the help of God. Then there's Pierre Hadot's philosophy is a way, as a way of life. Hadot says accepting a philosophy is like a religious conversion. It involves a total transformation of one's vision, lifestyle, and behavior. It turns our entire life upside down. You literally stake your life and your eternity on a set of ideas being true. In the ancient world, when philosophy was still young, its life-transforming power is, was widely recognized. The philosopher was not regarded as an expert in an academic field, but revered as a spiritual guide, Hadot says. He exhorted his charges to conversion and then directed his new convert converts to the paths of wisdom. Hada is seeking to recover that spiritual role for the secular philosophy. So is philosopher Alan de Button, author of Religion for Atheists. Button is founder of a school in London where students study philosophy not to earn an academic degree, but to ponder the most serious questions of the soul. One class titled Filling the God-Shaped Hole helps people fill the vacuum in their lives when they abandon traditional religions. The common thread running through these examples is that they are all attempts to fill the God-shaped hole with something other than God. One book makes the claim frankly in its title, The Little Book of Atheist Spirituality. Atheists are even founding their own churches. Britain now has its first atheist church. According to the news reports, dozens of gatherings dubbed atheist megachurches are springing up around the U.S. Atheists are freeloading the ceremonies of religious worship. They want to co-opt the rituals of Christianity while rejecting its reality. A Mass for Charles Darwin Not all atheists are aware of how much they hijack from Christianity. The most common pattern is to claim that atheism is based strictly on facts and science. Yet even a commitment to science can function as an idol, an ultimate commitment. When science is treated as the sole source of truth, then it becomes scientism. Philosopher Wilfred Sellers expressed a commitment to scientism when he said, Science is the measure of all things. Bertrand Russell tipped his hand in his remark, What science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. The assumption is that whatever cannot be known by science is not real. But consider, is that statement itself a fact discovered by science? 
Clearly not. It goes beyond anything science could possibly establish. It's a metaphysical assumption, an arbitrary definition of what counts as genuine knowledge. Scientism remains one of today's most popular idols. Any claim that begins with science no science scientists now know is likely to triumph all competing claims. As John Gray writes, science hasn't enabled us to dispense with myths. Instead, it has come a vehicle for myths, chief among them, the myth of salvation through science. Many of the people who scoff at religion are sublimely confident that by using science, humanity can march onwards to a better world. A commitment to science have, has even been shown to have a psychological effect similar to a religious commitment. The New Scientist reports on a study showing that under stress, atheists responded with the higher commitment to a belief in science. The article concluded, it's well known that religious faith can help believers cope with stress and anxiety by providing them with a sense of meaning and control at times of uncertainty. It now seems that a belief in science and a rationalistic outlook might do the same for the non-religious. Even the theory of evolution, often cited as a support for atheism, can function as a substitute religion. In the 1965 introduction to Darwin's Origi Origin of Species, W.R. Thompson observed that, for many biologists, the concept of organic evolution is an object of genuinely religious devotion, because they regard it as supremely int integrative principle. More recently, Michael Russ shocked his fellow atheists by pointing out that evolution often functions as a religion. Evolution is a promulgated as ideology, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality, and with worship, we might add. A few years ago, a mass was composed until entitled Missa Charles Darwin. Missa means mass. The piece is based on the five movement structures of the traditional mass. It sounds very much like Renaissance church music, but the texts from scripture have been replaced by excerpts from Darwin's writings, including on the origin of species and the descent of man. Evolutionary religion. Darwinism is not the only version of evolution on the market, yet most people, most alternative theories are more overtly religious. Biologist Stuart Kaufman is well known for his theory of self-organization, but he does not regard it as merely another scientific theory. It is a new world view, and with a new world view of God, a new view of God, not a transcendent, not as an agent, but as the very creativity of the universe itself. In other words, Kaufman treats God as a word for the ceaseless flux of the universe. That, he says, is God enough for me. Why retain the word God at all, which can connotes a transcendent, caring, intelligent person, when your theory really involves an imminent, non-caring, non-intelligent process, precisely to smuggle in the emotional power connected to the term. Kaufman is open about his intentions. We do what we what do we gain by using the word God? I suspect a great deal, for the word carries with it awe and reverence. If we can transfer that awe and reverence not to the transcend transcendental Abrahamic God of the Israelite tribe long ago, but to the stunning reality that confronts us, we will grant permission for the renewed spirituality and awe reverence and responsibility for all that lives, for the planet. In short, Kaufman hopes to inspire people to respond emotionally to a purely materialistic, materialist universe, as if it were the personal God of the Bible. He is another freeloader. Finally, there is econo economist and futurist Jeremy Rifkin, who promotes a quasi-pantheistic version of evolution. He envisions evolution as a process whereby an imminent mind evolves up the ladder of life, the great chain of being, 
Evolution is no longer viewed as a mindless affair, quite the opposite. It is a mind enlarging its domain up the chain of the species. In those words, we hear echoes of Hegel's concept of an absolute mind evolving upward through history. Rifkin goes on. One eventually winds up with the idea of the universe as a mind that oversees, orchestrates, and gives order and structure to all things. What are the implications of the pantheistic model of evolution? Most obviously, it eliminates a transcendent creator, which Rifkin takes to be a good thing. For it means that we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home. Therefore, we no longer feel obliged to, take, to make our behavior conform with a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. Instead, we are free to make up our own rules. It is our own creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters of reality. We create the world, and because we do, we no longer feel beholden to the outside forces. We no longer have to justify our behavior, and we are now the architects of the universe. We created the world. We create the world. We are the architects of the universe. Clearly, Rifkin is saying that if there is no transcendent God, then humans take his place. Humans become mini-gods. Rifkin ends with a hymn of evolved humanity. We are responsible to nothing outside ourselves, for we are the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. If this is not a theological vision of evolution, I don't know what is. Recognizing the religious nature of secular worldviews creates a level playing field. It undermines the pretensions of the secularists to the religious neural neutrality which they use to claim superiority over religion. That is, the claim is to be objective and fact-based, while discrediting religions as bias, base, biased and faith-based. Yet, no worldview is neutral, not even atheism or secularism. In relation to the Bible, in relation to the biblical God, secular people may claim to be skeptics, but in relation to their own God substitutes, they are true believers. To adapt an observation from C.S. Lewis, their skepticism is only the sur on the surface. It is for use on the other people's benefit or beliefs. They are not nearly skeptical enough about their own beliefs. What drives religious variants of evolution is a sense that there must be more to reality than the flat, one-dimensional vision offered by materialism. Evolutionists are reaching out for higher dimensions to answer the human longing for greater meaning to life. Those longings are one more expression of a general revelation. They are signposts to the biblical God. Losing faith, finding God. One way to highlight Christianity's attractive features is to show where secularists borrow from it. Another way is to ask what you lose when you give it up. I first started to appreciate Christianity only after I had left it behind. As a young person growing up in a Christian home, I was like the proverbial fish that does not know what water is. Sometimes losing faith is the path to finding God. Around the time I turned 16, I started asking basic questions. How do we know if Christianity is true? Are there any good reasons for holding to it? None of the adults in my life seemed to have, to have any of the answers. I once asked a university professor why he was a Christian. I, have, I hoped that such a highly educated person would offer a thoughtful response. But all he said was, it works for me. I thought, it doesn't work for me. Later, I had the opportunity to talk with the seminary dean. I hoped that a person highly trained in theology might have answers. But all he said was, don't worry, we all have doubts sometimes. As though I were just going through a, a psychological stage. I thought then, why, do, why don't you have answers for my doubts? 
Finally, I concluded that this pragmatic, psychologized version of Christianity had no serious answers. I rejected it and embarked on an intentional search for the truth. The decision struck me as a matter of intellectual honesty. In principle, if you do not have good reasons for holding something, then how can you really say you believe it, whether Christianity or anything else? Within a short time, I became a thoroughgoing relativist and skeptist. Skeptic. There may be happy pagans, why don't you know? There may be happy pagans who don't know what they are missing, but I was acutely aware of what I had lost. As a Christian, I had known that my life had a purpose, to live for a God and enjoy him forever, enjoy him forever, in the words of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. But if there is no God, and life is a chance product of blind material forces, what purpose does human life have? It is just a chemical accident on a rock flying through the cold, empty reaches of space. While still in high school, I started con cornering my friends and asking, what do you think is the purpose of life? Sadly, many of my classmates were not thinking much beyond the party that weekend. As a Christian, I had known that my actions had a significance that would last into eternity. But if there is no God, then why, when we die, we rot. Eventually, the universe itself will die a heat death, and all human civil civilizations will turn to dust. The best and highest achievements of the human race will have no lasting significance. As a Christian, I had known that the final reality beyond all temporal realities is love. The universe is a creation of a personal agent who fe thinks, feels, chooses, and acts. But if there is no personal God, then the final reality is blind mechanistic forces. There is no one out there who loves us or cares what happens to us. As Richard Dawkins writes, there is, at bottom... No design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pity, pity, pitiless indifference. As a Christian, I had accepted the existence of an objective moral standard. When I made choices, I could be confident that I was building my life on eternally valid truths. But if there is no God, do transcend, do transcendent moral truths even exist? Was there any way to know that I was constructing my life on things that really matter? Did I not know the word relativism? I did not know the word relativism. But... Okay. I did not know the word relativism, but among my high school friends, I was the one arguing that we cannot know if anything is genuinely right or wrong. I experienced what Satra meant when he said, we are condemned to be free, condemned to act in a moral vacuum, with no way to know if your choices will ultimately prove good or bad, beneficial or harmful. My angst was intensified by having lived overseas as an adolescent. Our large family could not afford hotels, we, so we slept in campgrounds while traveling across Europe, gaining a close-up view of diverse cultures and customs. We once drove to Turkey, traversing then-communist countries like Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. I had never witnessed such extreme poverty as in rural Bulgaria. The experience left me with an undeniable awareness that many of the things Americans take for granted are culturally relative. I began to wonder, is there any truth beyond all cultural, cultural traditions? Or are we trapped within limited 
changing human perspectives. Finally, as a Christian, I had known that God himself spoke to the human race through scripture. Many people regard the Bible as a grab bag of works by human authors, a record of spiritual experiences or a set of ancient myths devised to convey moral lessons. But scripture makes the striking claim that it is a record of communication from God who acts and speaks into human history. In the Old Testament, the prophets claim to speak the word of God. Thus says the Lord. In the New Testament, Paul calls scripture the oracle of God in Romans 3.2. Peter states that the Bible writers were inspired by the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter 1.21. Thus, Classic Christian theology regards scripture as a communication from a personal God. The heavens are open. When I embraced agnosticism, however, the heavens were closed. I was locked in my own mind, limited to my own tiny slot in the immensity of time and space. It seemed obvious to me that from that puny perspective, it was po impossible to know any transcendent or timeless truths. Indeed, it might be impossible to know any truth at all. After all, I could not step in outside my own head to gain an objective stance to verify my ideas. The logical conclusion is that is not just skepticism, but solipsism. The idea that we all really know that all we really know is the inside of our own experience. In my high school English notebook, I began doodling cartoons of the entire universe as a thought bubble inside my head. Bertrand Russell, my role model. The years I spent wrestling with more morale and intellectual skepticism were a dark and difficult period of my life. When people's religious beliefs erode, they sometimes stay in the ch church for the friendships and social support. They retain the Bible's commitment to an objective morality, at least to an objective morality for other people, so they won't rob or cheat you. But my stance was that if Christianity was not true, then I did not want any of its benefits. I aspired to be like Bertrand Russell who said atheists must build their mind, their own lives, on the scaffolding of unyielding despair. Why despair? Because atheism holds that there is no higher purpose to life, that man is the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving. That is, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. If atheism was true, then I did not want to flinch from accepting its pessimistic implications, which Russell went on to describe with poetic gloom, that all the laborers of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human ge genius, are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of the universe in ruins. William Provine, an evolutionary biologist at Cornell University, states the conclusion more bluntly. If no God exists, he says, then no ultimate foundations for ethics exist. No ultimate meaning in life exists, and free will is merely a human myth. During my years as an agnostic, I was not just working through questions like these in my mind, but living them out in my life. C.S. Lewis said he wrote Pilgrim's Regress to illustrate the impact of worldviews on lived experience. In the story, the main character encounters a variety of God's substitutes, including rationalism, materialism, idealism, and Freudism. On his journey to discover the true God, Lewis writes the, that the book illustrated the lived dialectic and not the merely argued dialectic 
of philosophical progress. I, too, was engaged in the lived dialectic, and every step of the way felt like a life-and-death struggle. While still in high school, I started walking to the library and pulling books off the philosophy shelf. If Christianity had no answers, I thought, maybe philosophy is the place where people discuss big questions like what is truth, what is the meaning of life. I was driven to study philosophy not by mere intellectual curiosity, but by an anguished search for answers to life. Later, while studying in Germany, I took a train to Labrie, the ministry of Francis and Edith Schaeffer. Nestled in a tiny village among the snowy peaks of the Swiss Alps. I intended only to meet up with the family members who were visiting briefly, but the approach to Christianity that I encountered there took me completely by surprise. It was the first time I met Christians who could address my questions, who engaged with the wider intellectual and cultural world. It was so appealing that paradoxical as it may sound, only after a month I left. To tell the truth, I fled. I was wary of being drawn in by the emotional attraction of Labrie instead of acting from genuine intellectual conviction. While there, however, I discovered apologetics, and I continued reading on my own. Eventually, I was intellectually persuaded that Christianity is true, or as I thought of it at the time, I admitted that God had won the argument. By then, I had no connection to a church, so I reached out again to Blabrie. A year and a half later, I returned to Switzerland for several additional months of study to deepen, deepen my understanding of a Christian worldview. What is your answer? The questions I had as a young person are not unique. Many teens and young adults struggle with intellectual questions even if they are not intellectuals in a stereotypical sense. Just talk to those who have rejected Christianity. Social sociologist Bradley Wright at the University of Connecticut asked former Christians why they deconverted. The researchers expected to hear stories about people leaving the church because they had been hurt or emotionally wounded. To their surprise, the, give, the reason given most frequently by formal Christians was that they could not get answers to their doubts and questions. In fact, they could not even get the church to treat their questions seriously. A former Southern Baptist, obviously still angry, said, Christians always use the word faith as their last word when they are too stupid to answer a question. Eventually, the doubters concluded that the church did not offer answers because there are no answers. Churches have an obligation to equip their congregations to answer the questions that inevitably rise from living a post-Christian society. Both young people and adults are subject to a constant barrage of secular and pagan ideas. Churches, schools, and families must take the responsibility for providing co cog cognate and compelling answers. One effective way of responding to doubters and skeptics is to help them face the real-world implications of their own views. I once had a conversation with a teenager who had been raised in a Presbyterian family. I don't think I'm Christian anymore, she told me. That's interesting, I said. What have you accepted instead? What? If there's no God, what then? What do you think is true? How would you support it? The teen was speechless. Her entire focus had been on reacting against her parents and church. It had not occurred to her that she now bore the responsibility to think through the options for herself and make an informed search for truth. As she began to study the alternatives, she realized that giving up on Christianity was not a matter of merely deleting a few files of doctrine from her mind. Christianity is an entire worldview that undergrids most of the great ideals of Western culture, from justice to equality to universal human rights. 
ideals that the teenager did not want to give up. When people raise questions about Christianity, often the best response is to not shut them down, but precisely the opposite. Start pressing them to take more seriously the implications of their own position. As a matter of intellectual integrity, they should stop freeloading and take a fearless inventory of the logical and practical conclusions of their own convictions. The stakes are high. What God said to the ancient Hebrews is just as true today. I have set before you life and death, blessing and a curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Deuteronomy 30, 19. Christianity is either true or false, but it cannot be dismissed as inconsequential. Lesson from To Kill a Mockingbird What's the first step in equipping ourselves to press people to the logical conclusion of their worldview? Obviously, we must know their worldviews. We need to educate ourselves on the systems of thought widespread in our culture. Think of it as a missionary training all Christians are called to be missionaries. Matthew 28, 18-20 As every missionary pastor or teacher knows, a key to effective communication is to know your audience. The more thoroughly we know our audience's worldview, the better prepared we will be to speak to their questions, objections, and hidden assumptions. As a character in To Kill a Mockingbird says, you never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb into his skin and walk around in it. What would you think of a missionary in a Muslim country who refused to learn about Muslim culture? He would not be very effective in communicating a biblical message. Cultivating a missional Mindset means being willing to learn both the language and the thought patterns of our mission field. When Paul said, I have become all things to all people, in 1 Corinthians 9.22, he did not mean dressing like the locals, nor was he embracing cultural relativism. Instead, he was talking, taking the assumptions of the audience into consideration in his language and approach. He tried to see the world through the eyes, their eyes, so he could communicate more persuasively. Ravi Sakarius grew up in, an Indi in India, but came to the West as a young man. So he says, being able to speak in two languages from opposite ends of the world helps you to be sympathetic, and I believe effective in not just hearing but listening in responding not to the question but to the questioner learning to listen is especially important with young people cultural change occurs so rapidly today that children often absorb assumptions that are radically different from adult culture one young woman wrote a blog lamenting that her family and church gave her no preparation for attending a secular university my parents had absolutely no idea what went on at university and therefore had no idea how to help me prepare for it. They did not teach her how to argue persuasively for Christianity in a pluralistic context. The most troubling thing was the amount of differing beliefs and worldviews that I encountered from professors and other students. At the time, I thought they had much better arguments than I did for the valid validity of their views. This represents a striking failure on the part of the adults in this young woman's life. First of all, a failure of love. A central motivation for learning about worldviews should be to love your neighbor. As said in Matthew 22, 39, Christians are called to love people enough to listen to their questions and do the hard work of finding answers. Scripture calls us to an exquisitely balanced approach. Speaking the truth in love, as said in Ephesians 4.15. That balance is spelled out in the flagship verse for apologetics. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. There's the truth. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. There's the love.
as said in 1 Peter 3.15. In the original Greek, the word Peter uses for defense is apolo apologia, from which we get the word apologetics. But he is not talking about giving answers to intellectual questions only. The verse appears towards the end of the letter dealing with largely with the theme of unjust suffering. Peter is just admo had just admonished Christians not to taking their own revenge, but to be willing to suffer for the sake of righteousness. Why does he speak of apologetics in this context? It seems that Peter is saying the goal of apologetics is not just to present better arguments, but to exhibit a better character, especially when suffering hostility and opposition. In Romans 1, Paul likewise sets his message in the context of suffering. That great ringing verse, the righteous shall live by faith, I said in Romans 1, 17. This is a quotation from the book of Habakkuk, where the prophet asks God why evil always seems to win, why God allows his people to be attacked, oppressed, exploited, and enslaved, and killed. Habakkuk 2, 4. God an God's answer is that Habakkuk must live by faith, confident that God is able to work good out of evil and injustice. If we do not cultivate the same confidence, the dangers that Christians will tend will tend toward defensiveness and anger. In today's grievance culture, it seems that some new group is always coming forward to complain that they are offended. It can be easy for Christians to pick up the same victim language, but our motivation for speaking out should not be that we are offended. After all, we are called to share in the offense of the cross. We are called to love the offender. Christians will be effective in reaching out to others only when they reflect biblical truth in their message, in their method, and in their manners. A biblical practice of love can attract the unlikeliest of converts. Even a young man living a wild life of sex, drugs, and gangs, whose dramatic story we will unfold at the end of the next chapter. Part 3. How Critical Thinking Saves Faith Critical thinking? The radio host burst out. Most people on the conservative Christian right would say that's one of the biggest dangers we have. This nonsensical idea of critical thinking. I was the guest on a radio program hosted by Barry Lynn, executive director of America's Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. This is an organization that works relentlessly to remove all expressions of Christian Christianity from the public arena. On the air, Lynn asked about my book-saving Leonar Leonardo. Why did you write a book about worldviews, about philosophies? I replied that my goal was to give people skills to understand the world they live in, to help them develop critical thinking. That's when Lynn interrupted me. He seemed incredulous that Christians would care about cultivating the mind. Later, when I wrote an article about the interview for Christianity Today, my husband and editor suggested the title, How Critical Thinking Saves Faith. Hostile radio hosts may not understand but scripture itself encourages humans to use their minds to examine truth claims. Test everything. Hold fast to what is good. 1 Thess Thessalonians 5.21 It turns out that you have to practice the first part of the verse, testing everything, in order to develop the wisdom to recognize and hold on to the good. Today, the need for critical thinking is greater than ever. We live in a technological age where information of in every kind is available at the click of a mouse. There is no safe place where young people can avoid the challenges, challenge of contrary worldviews. Christians must become independent thinkers with the tools to think critically about diverse points of view, weighing the evidence and judging the validity of arguments. The one who states his case first seems right. 
until the other comes and examines him. Proverbs 18, 17. Christians must learn to examine both sides in order to develop sales resistance to the many dubious ideas hawked in the media, politics, education, entertainment, and yes, churches. In today's pluralistic, multicultural world, no one can survive long on second-hand ideas. Some Christians seem to think the way to avoid being conformed to this world, Romans 12.2, is by avoiding worldly ideas. A better strategy is to learn the skills to critically evaluate them. G.K. Chesterton argued that ideas are actually more dangerous to a, the person who has not studied them. Because he has no mental filter, a new idea will fly into his head like wine to the head of a teetoler. He is more likely to become intoxicated. A, a Romans 1 strategy provides the basic tools to avoid being intoxicated. Its five principles will empower you to cut to the heart of any worldview and weigh its central tenets to gain an understanding of the times in which we live, as 1 Corinthians 12.32 says. With training in critical thinking, you will be prepared to interact with any point of view respectively and intelligently. In this chapter, we will survey several key applications to show how critical thinking can save your faith. We will end with the story of hip-hop artist Lecrae to discover why he is not ashamed of the gospel. Church, but not prepared. Churched, but not prepared. Recently, a mother told me with tears in her eyes that her son had lost his faith at a state university. The teen was a psychology major, and ever since Freud, most psychological theories have treated Christianity as a form of psychopathology, a symptom of neurosis, an infantile, an infantile regression. Though the young man came from a strong Christian family and church, he was completely unprepared to critically evaluate the theories he was learning in the classroom. With the semester, he had abandoned, within a semester, he had abandoned his religious upbringing altogether. How can we help a student in psychology who is struggling to respond to Freud's charge that religion is a symptom of emotional immaturity? Or a student in English who has an, to answer Foucault's charge that truth claims are merely power plays? Or a law student whose professor tells the class that law has no relation to morality. A unique feature of Romans 1 strategy is it can be applied universally to analyze and respond to any theory. Let's remind ourselves of its key elements. Principle number one is to identify the idol. Every non-biblical worldview starts with an idol, a God substitute. Romans 1 says that if humans do not worship the Creator, they will make a deity out of something in the created order. Like the blind man and the elephant, they fasten on some part of the created order and declare it to be the ultimate reality. Principle number two is to identify the reductionism. When one part of creation is deified, the other parts will be denig denigrated. Why? because a part is always too small to explain the whole. Something will always stick out of the box. That something will be suppressed, devalued, dismissed, or denied. Otherwise, it would count as evidence to falsify the worldview. Reductionism is always dehumanizing. It exchanges a high, value, high view of humanity made in the image of God for the image of something in the created order. And because the idol is something lower than the biblical God, its concept of humanity will also be lower. It will deny key attributes that make us distinctively human. And when reductionistic worldviews gain political power, the consequences are oppressive and coercive and inhumane. Principle number three is to test the worldview against the facts of experience. 
the truths of general revelation. No matter how hard people try to suppress the evidence for God, the created order itself keeps challenging them. Both physical nature and human nature give evidence of the creator. Therefore, every idol-based worldview will fail to fit the evidence. It will contradict the knowable facts of general revelation. The more self-aware people are, the more clearly they will realize that they cannot live consistently on the basis of their own reductionistic worldviews. The truths of general revelation, the things they can't help believing and living, create a gap between what they profess and what they practice. As a result, they live with a mental dualism, maintaining two set of inconsistent beliefs. Principle number four is to show that every reductionistic worldview is self-defeating. It commits suicide. That's because it reduces reason to something less than reason. Yet, the only way a worldview can build its own case is by using reason. Thus, it undercuts itself. It is self-refuting. Everyone who proposes a reductionistic worldview must make a tacit exception for his own thinking, at least at the moment he is stating the claim. But that, too, creates a logical inconsistency. It is an admission that there is one thing that the worldview does not cover, namely, the person who is proposing it. Either way, then, a reductionistic worldview fails. Principle number five is to make the case for a Christian worldview. By focusing on the points where competing worldviews fail, we can be assured that we are answering questions that are actually relevant. By identifying the points where non-Christians are freeloading, we can be confident that we are addressing areas where they sense a need for something more. Stealth Secularism the philosophies discussed in this book from the backbone form the backbone to all the we of Western thought. I've had students from many different disciplines, and they discover that the Romans 1 approach gives them tools to critique any theory, no matter what their field. An undergraduate recently wrote, The method of critique you taught in the, this class has been incredibly helpful to me, not just in class, but in my life, regarding books and watching movies. A master's student wrote, When watching television or movies with my family, I used to be afraid of secular ideas seeping into my psyche, but now I finally have the skills to identify and critique them. My kids are intrigued and delighted. The point about books and movies is especially important. After all, this is how most people pick up their ideas about life. They don't think, I need a person, a personal philosophy and sign up for a philosophy course at some local university. Instead, they absorb their ideas about life through the books they read, the movies they watch, and the music they listen to. Worldviews are not typically come with a warning label attached to tell us what we're getting into. They, are, they do not ask permission before invading our mental space. Instead, there is what we might call a stealth secularism that uses images and stories to bypass people's critical grid and hook them emotionally, sometimes without their even knowing it. That's why it is imperative to learn the skills of deciphering worldviews when they come to us not in words, when they are easier to recognize, but in the idiom of picture, composition, plotline, and characterization. Take, for example, one of the most influential philosophies covered in earlier chapters, materialism or naturalism. In the 19th century, a movement arose that was actually called literary naturalism. Novels and plays began to appear that portrayed humans as merely products of nature without free will, determined, to be their gene, determined by their genes and the environment. Virtually every student I have taught has read books by Jack London, The Call of the Wild, 
but they don't know what what they don't know is that as a young man London underwent what one historian calls a conversion experience to radical materialist materialism by reading the works of Charles Dar Darwin he memorized long passages from Darwin and could even quote them by heart like Christians who memorize scripture he wrote about dogs to soften the blow but his real message was that humans are nothing but evolved organisms with no free will governed by natural selection and survival of the fittest in London's short story the law of life by old Eskimo is left behind by his family to die in the snow as the wolves close in to devour him the old man ponders that evolution assigns the individual only one task to reproduce so the species will survive nature did not care to life she is one task gave one law to perpetuate was the task of life after that if the individual dies what did it matter at all was it not law of was it not the law of life the story pounds home the theme that humans have no higher purpose beyond sheer biological existence. High culture filters down to pop culture. So materialist themes appear in movies and television and on television as well. In a famous episode of Star Trek, the characters debate whether the android Lieutenant Commander Data is a machine. He is, of course, but Captain Picard report, retorts, it is not relevant. We, humans, too, are machines, merely machines of a different type. Naturalism tries to appeal by posing as a tough and realistic. But ironically, its main weakness is that it's not realistic enough. As we see in principle number three, it does not fit the real world. It holds that humans are essentially machines with no free will. But no one can live like a machine. We make choices every moment of the day. Critics point out that the literary naturalists themselves do not live by their own philosophy. A Yale historian says they accepted determinism as a theory, but not something to live by. I would suggest that is because no one can live by it in practice. It's not true to life. Philosophy in paint, not only literature, but also the visual arts, are deeply influenced by philosophy. Impressionism. Everyone knows what an impressionist painting looks like, and its little dabs and dashes of color. But why did an impressionists decide to break up images that way? Because they were influenced by the philosophy philosophy of empiricism, which claims that the ultimate foundation of knowledge is sensations. To reach that foundation, empiricism says, we must reach down to the level of sheer sensory input. We must not even interpret sensations in terms of discrete objects standing in a three-dimensional space, but only as patches of color filling our field of vision. That's why the greatest impressionist Claude Monet wrote, when you go out to paint, try to forget what objects you have before you. A tree, a house, a field, or whatever. Really think, here's a little square of blue, or an oblong of pink. Here's a streak of yellow. His goal was to cut through to the level of raw, immediate sense data. Spots, streaks, patches of color. Recall the, that according to empiricism, humans mentally construct the world out of color patches. See principle number one. Monet wanted to convey the same idea visually. Clearly, he was not interested in just painting pretty pictures. He was wrestling with the philosophical problem of knowledge, epistemology. Not in philosophical terms, but in an artistic terms. For many of us, it is easier to grasp abstract ideas when they are fleshed out in visual form. After learning how empiricism was expressed visually, 
how would you respond to someone who is an empiricist who says, I can't accept Christianity because its central claims cannot be directly verified by empirical science. You might respond by asking, why do you think empiricism should be the test for truth? After all, does anyone really think the ultimate basis for knowledge is color patches? Does anyone really reject everything non-empirical, like love or justice? In practice, no no one is fully consistent empiricist. It fails the practical test. Christianity respects the empirical dimension, see principles one and four, but no one, no one thread in a rich fabric of truth, but as one thread in a rich fabric of truth. Cubism. Take another example. Everyone knows what a cubist painting looks like with its little squares and rectangles. But why did the cubists decide to break up images that way? Because these artists were influenced by the philosophy of rationalism. The apex of the scientific revolution was the, developmental, the development of mathematical physics. In Galileo's famous painting, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics, and its characters, characters are triangles, circles, and other geometric figures. Rationalism thus inspired a kind of geometric formalism. The intellectual springboard for cubism was a remark by Saint Sene the art, that artists should interpret nature in terms of the cylinder, the sphere, the cone. Virtually a paraphrase of Galileo. The cubist's goal was to portray the underlying mathematical structure of the cosmos. They broke objects down into little squares and rectangles to reflect nature's hidden geometric blueprints. These rationalist ideas did not stay locked inside art galleries. In architecture, they inspired the international style, the glass and steel boxes that look like cubist buildings which populate so many cities today. Architects begin to think of themselves as social reformers who lead the way in restructuring society according to... According to, the, to a rational plan, they persuaded many cities to build huge housing projects, promising to solve a host of social problems in one fell swoop. From poverty to crime to drug abuse, the most influential was Le Corbusier, who called his building Machines to Live In, because they had the functional efficiency of machines. Architects expected the rationalist premise that humans are complex mechanisms whose problems can be fixed simply by slotting them into machines to live in. Many of the housing projects decayed into concrete prisons, dreary, depressing seedbeds of crime and social pathology, until they were finally dynamited to the ground. As one social critic writes, the decaying housing projects still seen in cities around the world remain a visible expression of the materialist and rationalist concept of human life. When ideas come out of the university and into public policy, it is easier to identify their flaws. A materialist and rationalist concept of human life fails to take account for our full humanity, thus its consequences are inhuman because Christianity has a much richer view of human nature. Its consequences are humane and life-affirming. Abstract Art The art movement that public finds perhaps most puzzling is abstract art. Why did the artists stop painting objects at all? Because they were influenced by pantheism, 
The first abstract painter was Kandinsky, who embraced a blend of Eastern and Western mysticism. He argued that the way to opposite philosophical materialism was to get rid of material objects. In his words, abstract art would literate, liberate the mind from the harsh tyranny of the materialistic philosophy, becoming one with the most powerful agents of spiritual life. The purpose of an abstract painting, then, is to free the mind from the preoccupation of material objects and draw the viewer up to the spiritual realm. The goal is to impart a sense of the Buddhist mystical state known as sayata, sanyata, the great void or emptiness. Francis Schaeffer off offered a fascinating phrase to describe this kind of of content-free religious experience. He called it mysticism with nobody there. It may lift us out of the ordinary mundane world, but to connect us with what? Not, not with a transcendent person who loves us and communicates with us, but with sheer emptiness, the void. Marth Rothko painted several large, dark, monochromatic panels for the Rothko Chapel in Houston. When he was saying with, what was he saying with these somber, melancholy paintings? The person who commissioned the paintings said they expressed the silence of God, the unbearable silence of God. Shortly after finishing the paintings, before the chapel even o opened, Rothko committed suicide. A mysticism with nobody there is not enough to give a sense of significance and meaning to life. Postmodernism. What about postmodernism? How is that expressed in the arts? Recall the postmodernism is a claim that there is no meta narrative or universal storyline valid for all people at all times. Each community has its own storyline for making sense of the world. How would an artist give the idea visual expression? By refusing to give a work of art any coherent overall design. This explains why deconstructionist artists favor the pastiche or collage, a paperwork of disconnected images that defy any attempt at interpretation. For example, the famous collages by Robert Rauschenberg says that says one art historian juxtapose images image images in ways to suggest random incoherence to which the artist the view and the viewer can bring no meaningful order what was Rauschenberg saying with these disconnected images that life's random occurrences cannot be made to fit in any inherent hierarchy of meaning. Postmodern post architecture has its own version of the pastiche or collage. As one journalist puts it, postmodernism has brought us girders hanging unfinished out of the edges of buildings, archways cut off in space, and walls which don't meet walls. Ravi Zuck Caris described seeing a building designed by a postmodern architect. I had one I had just one question, Zacharis said. Did he do the same with the foundation? It was an apologetics argument put in artistic terms. Whether in art or literature or education or philosophy, mathematics or science, Every theory or movement is inspired by an underlying philosophy. If you master the strategic principles in this book, they will equip you to identify and engage critically with the ideas that have shaped the Western world in every subject area. What wags your theology? As Romans 1 approach will even help you sort out claims in theology, Robert Garcia is a philosophy professor, but as a teenager, he went to a Lutheran college to study theology. At the time, the vogue was non-orthodoxy. 
a movement to demi theologize the Bible, stripping it from its supposedly mytho mythological elements. Initially, the young freshman was puzzled. Why was the teaching in the classroom so different from what he had learned at home and church? Garcia finally discovered that neo-orthodoxy was strongly influenced by the philosophy of existentialism. He realized that the best way to understand the theology was to walk down the hallway of the, the philosophy department and study existentialism that he had inspired it. This was a critical insight. Virtually every form of theology has been influenced to some degrees by philosophy. Consider the leading schools of liberal theology. Classic 19th century liberalism recast Christianity in terms of Hegelian idealism. It essentially identified the Holy Spirit with Hegel's quasi-pantheistic absolute spirit. Salvation was redefined as the gradual unfolding of the purpose of an in, imminent deity in the in and through historical process. It would be manifested in the progressive recognition of the universal fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man, the transformation of the word itself, world itself into a human brotherhood. In the words of liberal churchman Le Man Abbott. More recently, liberation theology redefined Christianity in terms of Marxism. Gustavo Gutierrez, who coined the term, writes, Liberation theology categorizes people not as believers or unbelievers, but as oppressors or oppressed. Feminist theology recast Christianity in terms bar borrowed from sec secular feminism. Eli Elizabeth Schusler Florencia says a feminist hermeneutic does not appeal to the Bible as a, its primary source, but begins with women's own experience and vision of liberation. A popular theology in many mainline seminaries is process theology, an offshoot of Plat Platonism. See principle number two. It holds that God is in the world as the soul is in the body. Thus, God is not infinite, but finite. God is not omniscient, all-knowing, or omnipotent, all-powerful. This is process theology's answers to the problem of evil. God is doing the best he can. Does God not have the power to foresee the future or prevent evil from happening? The cutting edge today is postmodern theology, inspired obviously by postmodernism, like secularism, like secular postmodernism. It denies that humans have access to the timeless universal truth, even in scripture. And in the end of apolo in the end of apologetics, Marin Penner writes. We can, of course, say objectively true things directly, like, for example, that it is 27 degrees Celsius, negative 27 degrees Celsius, outside this morning, or that God was in Jesus Christ reconciling to himself the world. The point, however, is first that these sorts of objective facts or statements are only approximately true and are made from a finite con contingent perspective. By citing scripture, 2 Corinthians 5.19, Penner is asserting that even its statements are made from a finite contingent perspective. Humans are trapped in the prison house of language after all. Postmodernism, postmodern Christians typically reject apologetics claiming that if you use reasons and arguments to defend biblical truth, then you have capitulated to enlightenment modernism. Yet the line of reasoning you have learned in finding truth is informed by scripture itself, which means its roots are pre-modern. 
and its relevance is transhistorical, applying to all cultures and historical periods. In all the examples above, liberal schools of theology have redefined classic Christian theology in the shape of holding an idol-based philosophy, yet they continue to use traditional theology, terminal, term, ter, traditional philosophy terminology, theological terminology. Garcia told me, my college professors insisted on using Orthodox Christian terms and language, but vested with meanings imported from secular philosophies. That is what made their teaching so baffling and deceptive. Moreover, liberal theologies are not taught objectively as a way to gain a critical understanding of them. Instead, Garcia says, they are taught in a tri triumphalistic spirit as sources of enlightenment and liberation from your parents' naive supernaturalist Christianity. This goes a long way toward explaining why students who study theology at leading seminaries and universities often end up rejecting the orthodox Christianity they started out with. In every field, Christians must learn critical thinking skills. Otherwise, we may simply absorb idol-based philosophies from the intellectual atmosphere. When I was in my early 20s, working my way through Bible school in Los Angeles, I had a job as a teller at First Savings and Loan. We were carefully trained to discern the difference between genuine and counterfeit bills. By the same token, we all must train ourselves to discern the difference between worldviews, which are, which are the currency of thought. Critique and Create At its best, apologetics includes not only the critique of idols, but also the creation of life-giving alternatives. Christians often have a habit of defining themselves as what they are against. Yet, to oppose what is wrong, it is most effective to offer something better, to overcome evil with good, as Romans 21, 12, 12, 21 says. If science is often used to bolster arguments for materialism and determinism, then Christians should make it their goal to do better, more accurate science. If literature is used to glamorize sin and brokenness, then Christians should fire up their imaginations to create higher quality, more inspiring works of fiction. If movies and music are vehicles for emotionally hooking people into Hollywood worldviews, then the best countermeasure is to create more compelling, more beautiful forms of art that express a biblical worldview. And if philosophy can lead to atheism, the solution is to craft more reasonable, more ins incisive, more truthful ways of thinking. As C.S. Lewis wrote, good philosophy must exist for, if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. I've had philosophy majors in my classes whose parents and, pa and pastors warned them not to study the subject, quoting Paul's warning not to be taken captive by philosophy in Colossians 2.8. But as Dallas Willard points out, when scripture commands us not to vain philosophy, to avoid vain philosophy, it does not mean we should avoid all philosophy. After all, when scripture commands us to avoid immodest clothing, it does not mean we should avoid all clothing. In every area of life, our aim should be to counter the bad by cultivating the good. A total book for total truth. A major barrier to cultivating the good in every area is the modern culture reduces Christianity to only one part of life, to a message of salvation telling you how to get to heaven. As a result, few think of Christianity as a worldview giving fundamental principles that apply to all of life. Yet scripture itself teaches that knowledge of that knowledge of God provides a universal framework 
Consider these passages. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Psalms 111.10, Proverbs 117, 1.7, Proverbs 9.10, Proverbs 15.33. In Christ, we are all treasures, in Christ are all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2.3. Christianity is the key to all that is good and right and true. Ephesians 5.9. These are passages really teaching that the fear of the Lord is the foundation of all wisdom, the key to all that is true. That claim seems radical. But now that we have learned about idols, the biblical claim is easier to understand. The Bible is simply describing how all systems of thought work. All start with something that is regarded as ultimate, unconditioned, divine, which in, in turn functions as the controlling motif, motif for everything that follows. The fear of some god is the beginning of every proposed worldview. In this regard, Christianity is like every other answer to the riddle of the universe. Its starting assumption provides the logical basis for everything that follows. That's why scripture insists that true truth begins with God. The Bible relates the plot line of the of universal comic history, cosmic history. All true knowledge finds a place within its storyline. Alan Bloom, author of best-selling book The Closing of American Mind, says that through much of American history, the concept of a unified truth came from the Bible. It created a common culture, one that unified the simple and the sophisticated, the rich and the poor, the young and the old, as the very model for a vision of the order of the whole of things. But as the Bible loses influence, the West is losing its sense of any unified truth. The very idea of such a total book is disappearing. Bloom laments with a and with it the idle idea of total truth. Parents send their children to school to learn specialized skills so they can get a job, but they have lost the ideal of becoming a whole person living out an integrated version vision of life. Contrary to what is commonly thought about the book, even the idea of the whole is lost. Yet the idea of total truth is being regained today, often in unexpected places. Crazy Cray, how do we break free? God met me where I was, at where I was at, baggy jeans and earrings. With those words, the celebrated hip-hop artist Lecrae Moore begins his story. Growing up without a father, he experienced a childhood of abuse and neglect. He filled his life with drugs, theft, alcohol, sex, gay and gang activity. He was so wild that his friends nicknamed him Crazy Cray. He was a po poster child for every stereotype of urban subculture. What it took to bring him to Christianity was someone who was not afraid of that subculture, who knew that the real problem for Lecrae was not his culture, but his sin and brokenness. A white na man named Joe loved the black teenager enough to enter into his culture and speak his language. Today, Lecrae is the president and co-founder of Reach Records and is the winner of several Dove Awards and a Grammy Award. His album, uh, Anomaly, was the first album ever to top both gospel albums and Billboard 200 chart. In a conference presentation, Lecrae said a key turning point in his life was when he grasped what comes after conversation or conversion. When he understood that Christianity is not just a religious truth, it's a total truth. In other words, the real transformation came when he realized that Christians are called to roll up their sleeves and work out the implications of a biblical worldview for justice and politics, for science and scholarship, for art and music, and all the rest of life. 
We've limited Christianity, we've limited Christianity to salvation and sanctification, he said. But Christianity is the truth about everything. If you have a Christian worldview, that means you see the world through that lens, not just how people get saved and what to stay away from. Lecrae's message is that we do not need to be afraid of cultural differences because Christianity has the resources to speak to every culture. Quoting from my book, Total Truth, Lecrae says, The reason Christians hold back from being salt and light in the world is that they are trapped in the sacred-secular divide. We live fractured and fragmented lives. Church and family rarely speak to our work in public life. We navigate between two separate worlds. Most religions tell you not only how to be right with God, but how to interpret the world we live in, Lecrae explains. Historically, Christians have been good at the first function, saving souls, but not at helping people interpret the world around them. We limit spirituality to salvation and sanctification. Salvation is the crucial first step in Christian life, of course, but how do we deal with politics, science, economics, bioethics, TV, music, and art? Typically, we leave people to their own devices. We usually don't operate out of a biblical worldview. Instead, we tend to have bifocals, half seeing things as spiritual and half seeing things as secular. Where did the sacred-secular split come from? Not from the Bible. It came from the Greeks. The reason is that they thought matter was eternal. A great divide was born when the Greek philosophers argued that matter was pre-existent and eternal, that matter contained the ability to resist the Creator, Lecrae explains. As Christians, we refute that claim with the doctrine that only God is pre-existing and ex eternal ex nihilo, from nothing. He is the source of all creation. The implication is that no part of creation is inherently bad or evil. Everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, as said in 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. Most evil consists of perversion of good things, Lecrae explains. God gave us the ingenuity and tools to make a butcher knife so we can use it to murder and serve food to the homeless. How can we heal the sacred secular split, which marginalizes and disempowers Christians? How do we break free of this split that robs the gospel of its power to redeem every aspect of our lives? Lecrae asks, the answer is to understand that Christianity is saving truth and it's sanctifying truth, and we, but we believe that it's total truth. It is the truth about every aspect of life, from economics to masculinity to marriage. God has the right view of all these things. This is not just pious talk for Lecrae. He has worked hard to understand how the principle of total truth applies to his own work, in contrast to some Christians who might be prone to write off hip-hop music as evil, he is determined to cultivate and create <coughs> cultivate the genre's creativity and artistry. Lecrae once told me that discovering total truth has enriched his art, that it liberated him to address all areas of life in his lyrics. Christian music is the music that addresses any subject area from biblical perspective. Christians are called to be ambassadors for, for Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.20, and that means we need to prepare ourselves as thoroughly as any professional working in international relations. When I lived in Washington, D.C. area, I often met graduate students preparing to be ambassadors and diplomats, and I discovered that they were very familiar with the concept of worldview, not because they were reading Christian books on the subject, but because it was a focus of their secular graduate studies. Their courses taught that the critical factor in engaging a foreign culture is not learning the language, but the worldview. 
Most people are intimidated by worldviews that they do not understand, Lecrae says. To overcome our fears, we need to be driven by compassion for those who are suffering under the tyranny of false idols. In a rap titled Truth, Lecrae talks about people in the grip of idols in their hearts. His music aims to release people from the power of false gods by counterposing the truth, the power of truth. In recent years, Lecrae has spearheaded the unashamed movement, which takes its lead from Romans 116. The hip hop artists associated with Lecrae and Reach Records even call themselves 116 Click. Lecrae has the number 116 tattooed on his right arm. The unashamed movement aims to inspire people to live out biblical truth with confidence in every area of life. No area is off limits. No area is too scary because you might lose your grip on your Christian convictions. Let me end with a final quote from Lecrae. What we need to realize is that Christianity is total truth not just religious truth because it's total truth because it is total truth it is relevant and applicable to all areas of life the five strategic principles in finding truth can help you live an unashamed life whether at work at school or with your family and friends they will provide you with the tools to recognize what's right and what's wrong with any worldview and then to craft a biblically for informed perspective that is both true and humane. The end. We did it.